Good evening, everybody. Great to be with you tonight. <clears throat> I, uh, um, it's a real pleasure to be with you. I want to get things started. We have a lot of amazing content to, to work through tonight. And so I'm going to begin things in a good way. I'm in Peterborough and Michisagi territory. Uh, and before I give a land acknowledgement, I'd like uh, everybody, if you can, to use the chat function. This is something we love to do and love to see. If you'd like to add uh, a recognition of the traditional territory that you're joining us from tonight uh, or where you live, uh, we'd welcome that also in the chat function. I'm here at the Canadian Canoe Museum and as such, the Canoe Museum respectfully acknowledges that we are situated on Treaty 20 Michi Sagig territory in the traditional territory by the, uh, covered by the Williams Treaties First Nations. The Canoe Museum also recognizes the contributions of Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous peoples in shaping this community and this country as a whole. As an organization that stewards the world's and largest and most significant collection of canoes, kayaks, and paddled watercraft, we will honor and share the cultural histories and stories within this collection in all that we do. So we have uh, a mixture of live conversation tonight, uh, presentation, and some recorded. Uh, I'm, I'm joining you right now on the second floor in our exhibition hall. Many of you may recognize where I am. I'm actually right next to a 28-foot chichiman uh, made by César Newashish from Manoan, uh, Itzigamek First Nation in Quebec. And uh, <clears throat> We're gonna spend a fair amount of tonight's presentation actually in the collection center, but we can't do that right now because it is pitch black. And so the slide that you saw at the beginning, uh, we, it doesn't look like that at all. So we've recently just done some recording back there to give you a full walkabout and dive into the amazing challenges and opportunities of the collection. And then we're gonna come back here and, and pick it up from there. Before we uh, launch that video, which is uh, 17 minutes long, um, I'd like to just uh, mention that tonight's virtual tour has been made possible by the investment of the Ontario Trillium Foundation's Resilient Communities Fund. This has been an incredible and game-changing support for the museum, and we are grateful for their investment, which is allowing us to pivot our in-person programming to virtual programming, especially during these times of pandemic, and this support is, is, is helping the museum in 2020 and 2021. I could also tell you that uh, Karen and uh, her colleague Jen Bernard uh, earlier today were doing digital outreach programming to grade nines, I believe, in Whitehorse, and then uh, grade seven to nine in Ayuituk, Grease Fjord on Ellesmere Island, Nunavut Territory. So a lot of great uh, virtual outreach program happening while the museum is closed for a good part of every week, and, uh, and this support has been terrific. So why don't we roll the film and we'll jump right into the amazing work that's underway in the back building and I'll see you on the far side of it. So here we are behind the scenes at the Canadian Canoe Museum in the collection storage and I have to tell you this is one of my favorite opportunities in any museum if we're so lucky to get behind the the doors of the collection center and I'm surrounded by hundreds upon hundreds of canoes and kayaks from across Canada and around the world. Now, as we get ready to move from this museum to the next, each canoe goes through a number of steps and processes. You wanna handle objects like these as few times as you can to minimize damage and, uh, and risk to the object. And of course, for time and care and handling and resources. And so we've, we've packed in a lot of work with each object while it comes off of its storage mount. You can see behind me the, a wall of racking with pallets and dugout canoes placed on those. We, uh, we have an, a whole range of different storage methods for the watercraft here. Each canoe is brought up to the front and that's where the team takes on the work. So the principal steps to get these canoes and kayaks ready, first off is to assess the object. Then there's a pretty thorough cleaning and the cleaning often involves brushing and vacuuming, very careful work, uh, and in some cases, some spot cleanings as well. Remember, some of these canoes uh, have come out of canoe houses or boat houses in their past. We're moving from a tired old industrial facility and we're moving into a beautiful brand new facility uh, with class A conservation standards. And so a lot of measures are taken to keep the, that facility as clean as, they, uh, as it can be. 
risk management for pests and, and other steps. So the cleaning is a deep cleaning, uh, and this is careful hands and a thoughtful approach on each object. Then they are documented. We do a lot of photography, measurements, we assess some principal damages or, or conservation needs that may need to be addressed before they are moved. If that work can be done on the spot, it is. If not, we set it aside uh, and it gets some follow-up. Once that work has been done, then the, uh, the canoe, once it's been cleaned and documented, it needs to be encapsulated. And this is where we're essentially pulling on a long plastic tube around each and every canoe, allowing it to breathe for about a week or two in case any moisture was used on certain canoes for the cleaning so that we're not trapping moisture inside. And then they're sealed off and carefully tagged. And we're going to be tracking each and every object uh, for where it ends up in its new home. The last stage, and we haven't begun that yet because the equipment hasn't arrived, is that each and every canoe will be fitted with a long-term storage pallet. And this is a framework that it's placed on that cradles the hull and it will be lifted and put onto the future racking in our new home uh, in the collection center. Unless, of course, it's going on exhibit. I'd like to give a shout out to the fabulous, the small but mighty team that have been doing this work and that began this summer, in fact. These are interns from the Museum Management Program at Sir Sanford Fleming. They've always been terrific uh, when they've, they've brought their, their skills to the museum and this has been no exception. Uh, we've also had students through the Young Canada Works Program, through uh, Ministry of Heritage and the Canadian Museums Association. Uh, and uh, also some colleagues uh, from the staff team. Uh, Jen Bernard, you know who you are. Um, when you're not uh, otherwise doing digital outreach programming, you're, you are uh, hard at work uh, here in the, in the Collection Centre working on the watercraft. The museum also has always relied on its fabulous volunteers and we've had a few who have who've been able to join us. Carefully, of course, uh, in terms of, of precautions with COVID and we can manage the numbers here and the spacing. But uh, so grateful for the team and the excellent work that they're bringing to this. So where are we at now with this collection? We began back in July and we are certainly building up a, a pace and the efficiencies of the steps and who's doing what and how is that done. I'm delighted to say that uh, a few months later, as we are now, uh, we are past the quarter mark of the museum's entire collection that has been fully processed up to the point of being ready to be fitted for its pallet. It's exciting, but that means that we still have three quarters of the collection to go of about 650 canoes, kayaks, and paddled watercraft. So there's a lot of work to, yet to be done. Let's, uh, let's take a walk around here and uh, I wanna show you some of, the, uh, some of the watercraft in particular, what we're learning along the way and some of the wonderful stories. Uh, we've chosen to group all of the watercraft in this space by construction method, with some exceptions uh, where we need to store the uh, really large uh, canoes and kayaks. But um, at the end of the day, what we know about every single canoe or kayak in this museum's collection is how it was made. Of course, in some cases, we know when it was used or when it was built where it was made, where it was used, where the previous owner once lived and, and had a lifetime uh, with that object. But we don't know that about every single canoe. And so if we were to walk together in person, I would be pointing out the different clusters throughout here to my right, to your left are the wideboard constructed canoes. This is an early mid 19th century method of canoe fa fabrication. These are canoes typically built of three broad planks per side. They have been fastened to hardwood ribs inside. There's a whole myriad different ways of actually the finessing of the joinery, but the wideboard canoes are, are the first run of this lot. And behind those are the, the longitudinal strip canoes, so-called cedar strip canoes, uh, prevalent at cottages uh, all around. And this is a, a late 19th century patented method as well. Behind those I know are the cedar rib, which is another amazing method of manufacturing canoes. Uh, Harold's double seater patented method. These are all canoes built on uh, molds. They're hardware fastened. There's quite a robust construction technique. To the far corner uh, over in, in the far end, we have all of the composite construction. So these are the carbon fiber, the fiberglass Kevlar, and many other different methods. Uh, the molded veneer hulls. This is where a lot of the flat water competition hulls are kept. And then there are also canvas skin on frame canoes. And, and other groupings. Now, to my left are birch bark canoes, about 55 birch bark canoes. And I'm gonna take you a little closer and we'll, we'll have a look at some special considerations we're giving those and why we're gonna hold off 
uh, on, on working with these until the warmer months uh, in the coming year. So one of the three canoes and kayaks that I've specifically pulled out for our visit today uh, is this uh, enchanting little birch bark canoe, this Wigwas Ichiman, just under 13 feet long. And this was made by Chuck Commanda. Chuck and his family are from Gidigon Zibi in Quebec. Um, you know, Chuck's grandparents, Mary and William, are very well, were very well-known canoe makers in their community and uh, across Canada and around the world. The museum's collection cares for several canoes by his grandparents. This canoe carries many hallmarks of, uh, of the Commanda family and traditions that Chuck, I think, uh, learned from his grandparents uh, when he worked with them as a child. And of course, Chuck has built his own style in this. But uh, what I certainly recognize here is carrying on the, the etched winter bark. So remember, the outside of a birch bark canoe is actually the inside of the the outer bark of the tree itself. And when it's peeled off in the cooler months, you can scrape away a dark film, revealing uh, the lighter inner bark that, that's there. So in fact, there's been etchings all the way along the hull to reveal the lighter surface and leaving intact where it's dark. This was uh, also an important canoe in Chuck's career as a canoe maker himself. This was the, the last canoe that his grandfather, William, uh, ever saw before he passed on. And uh, I know it holds a special place in Chuck's heart as it does uh, for us here at the museum. Now, in terms of uh, caring for a collection of birch bark canoes, uh, we've chosen to leave the bark canoes and a number of other types until the warmer months in the coming year. Um, there, they are, of course, um, there are some very fragile elements to a birch bark canoe. The watap, the spruce root lashings along the gunnels, the stitching to the hull. This is split spruce or jack pine or other coniferous roots. And now this is a rather young canoe, but on the very old ones, they become incredibly fragile. And we have to handle and, and touch these objects, especially in cold months, as, as seldom as possible to, to um, not cause further damage. Also, the spruce resin pitch uh, on the hulls gets incredibly fragile. And again, any, uh, any handling of these when, when, they're, when they're cold is just not, not worth the risk. So we're setting these beautiful birch bark canoes aside until, uh, until the spring of 2022 when we get into it. I'm gonna take us over to a next size up in the museum's collection uh, and for now for something completely different. So we've now made our way up a long corridor here in front of a wall of about 60 dugout canoes. And they have also yet to be, to be cleaned and prepared for, for transfer to the new museum. And we're stopping in front of uh, a number of skin on frame uh, canoes and kayaks in the museum's collection. These are lightweight skin stretched around a rigid wooden frame. They pose their own unique challenges. We're gonna get into that in a moment, but let's just take a little look at uh, what's in front of me here. Oftentimes, as we might walk uh, through the collection with guests and, and explore the collection together, this would be mistaken, or uh, rightfully so, it would be described as a kayak. Uh, but the, the makers of this vessel would uh, disagree. This is called a canoe. And it's um, a double blade decked over canoe made in Germany. And there's a very long tradition of this. Johannes Klepper in Germany patented the first Falk boat folding uh, collapsible skin on frame canoe, I think in 1905. And there is a really interesting dynamic um, movement of outdoor uh, exploration in these folding ca canoes and kayaks. The one in front of me is not a collapsible. It really requires specialized hardware to make it work like that. But this canoe was made here in Ontario by German prisoners of war who had been pulled out of the European theater during the war and sent to Northern Ontario uh, to work in a, in a lumber camp at Nice River, uh, just inland from Lake Superior, a piece. And uh, so we understand this one was made from the scrap heaps at the, the prisoner of war ca uh, internment camp. And if we take a closer look, I'm just gonna show you here along the sides, we can actually see that the rib framework right under my fingers here, these are hoops. It certainly look like it for the, the hoop stock for wooden barrels uh, salvaged and recycled to make the frames. Who knows where the lumber came from, if it was left over 
woodwork for building the barracks on site in the trash pile. Certainly the, the paint for the canvas would have been requested. But it's not the only internment camp that we've heard of that was allowed to build something of a, a little yacht club uh, for, for evening uh, recreation. I, maybe it might have been on Sundays. But uh, it's quite lovely to think as, as uh, in the midst of, of um, the war uh, in Europe, these very fortunate uh, prisoners of war brought out of Europe, sent to Northern Ontario to cut timber and allowed to take turns paddling uh, a canoe like this uh, on, on remote rivers in Northern Ontario. I understand too, many of the prisoners of war who spent time in Northern Ontario certainly returned to Canada after the war and after the amnesty and, and made a life here. So is it something, is it nothing? Is uh, a question that you might ask. Certainly, despite all of the, the, the fragility and the decay to the skin, this is a very important piece in the museum's collection because it gives us a glimpse into a moment that you wouldn't expect to see uh, in the story of the canoe perhaps, but uh, really into an important moment of time. For collection transfer, these pose real challenges, as you can imagine, to make sure that they're fully cleaned before they're encapsulated. Now, some of the damages to this, the windows into the canvas, will let us to make, sh make sure that we've gotten in and cleaned all of the cleanable areas before it goes into quarantine. But a, a canoe like this needs, a canoe like this needs a whole lot more than that. It needs extensive stabilization, uh, some conservation treatment, etc. And uh, someday, perhaps, it'll make its way into a, a temporary exhibit in our new museum. Okay. Now we're going to move along to the dugout canoes, and uh, we're going to look at uh, a really special one in the museum's collection. Okay, so we are with the big canoes, the great canoes. This is an area where we have a lot more room, and uh, they have room to stretch out and, uh, and, and feel comfortable. This is a stunning, stunning dugout canoe from Papua New Guinea. Um, a real celebration of Gogodala uh, carving and canoe culture. Uh, beside me to the left is a 36-foot birch bark canoe. To my right, an even longer dugout canoe from the other side of the landmass that is Papua New Guinea. This is from the Indonesian side of Irian Jaya, made by the Azmat uh, canoe people there. These are exquisite uh, canoes. Don't forget, these are paddled standing up. So those of you with an SUP, with a stand-up paddleboard, um, imagine now a much longer hull, completely round-bottomed, narrower than your board, and paddled by you and 20 or 50 of your uh, family and friends um, at, at very high speeds. So they, these are very impressive canoe traditions to, uh, to, to consider against what is more familiar perhaps here in Canada. I'm always drawn to this, as are all the guests, by the ornate carvings on the ends. These are animals in crests, uh, family crests worked into these. And uh, it's been very exciting to see every year uh, the, pa the Gogodala Canoe Festival um, since its um, development many years ago. And it's had a, a brief hiatus of, a, of several years and it, and it launched again <clears throat> last year, which was terrific to see. This is a celebration of, of canoe culture in Western Fly District in, in Papua New Guinea and, uh, and, and really an amazing sight. Uh, we don't know enough yet about this story to, um, to really share that with guests at the museum. And so there's a lot of work to be done. As we're doing with many of the indigenous watercraft in the museum's collection, we're reaching out following these canoes and kayaks uh, where they lead us back to their home and, uh, and, and, and form a bridge there. And hopefully this canoe will be a conduit uh, for the community and uh, perhaps even the family to share its stories through the Canoe Museum to a wider audience here in Canada. So you can see that this, uh, this dugout canoe has already been fitted with a travel pallet. And this is the type that we'll be uh, making for the canoes and kayaks that are headed onto exhibit in the new museum home. This is just a simple wood deck. Uh, with steel stanchion posts, the heads on top can swivel and we've worked strapping uh, between the two heads in order to conform best to the hull. This is fully round bottomed and would not sit easily uh, right down on its belly if that was our approach. And in fact, a sling, a very simple sling for most hull forms is the best way to cradle the hull properly. Given their weight, enough of these doesn't pose too much strain on the hull. In fact, we can really give it all of the support that the hull needs. But this is uh, this canoe, after a good cleaning and preparation encapsulation, is, is ready to go. 
and it'll be thrilling to see it brought into the new exhibition along with its stories. But for the canoes and kayaks that are headed into the collection hall, where they may live on racking uh, on their own pallets for decades uh, and be brought down to be shared uh, with guests and researchers uh, from time to time, we've brought a lot more um, sophisticated armature to provide the long-term supports that these canoes and kayaks will need uh, for years to come. So why don't we wrap things up here in this beautiful collection hall. The light is just about to drop and uh, we're gonna head up into the main building and we'll uh, take a look at the long-term storage pallets that we're developing for the new collection hall. I'd like to just take a moment to um, throw out a couple more quick shout outs that uh, are well-deserved. Earlier, I was thanking some of the team and honestly, um, a fabulous colleague of mine, Beth Stanley, is an associate curator here at the museum and she is overseeing all of the uh, collection transfer work that's underway and um, also uh, working on the collection cleaning is Paul Newmeyer, a volunteer coming in uh, uh, regularly once a week and offer a very special, very special and heartfelt uh, shout out to Dane Allendorf. Dane began with us as an intern uh, through the Museum Management Program at Fleming College here in Peterborough. And uh, like a number of past interns, we've been able to keep Dane on employed here at the Canadian Canoe Museum. He's brought such an amazing willingness to help out in any way he can, his technique, his skills, his, his, his approach, his care for the collection as he does a tremendous amount of work. Uh, he's absolutely essential to this, this collection move uh, at this time. So he has a bright future ahead of him and we're, we're grateful to have you with us, Dane. Thank you. What we're looking at here, honestly, I could talk about for hours. Uh, this, is, uh, this, is my, right, this is my favorite building uh, in this country. This is our new home. Uh, this is, I think, the favorite building for many involved in this project, certainly. This is a 65,000 square foot museum that has been compressed onto, uh, in its footprint to minimize the impact on a very sensitive waterfront site. And so it is a two-story museum. Uh, it's a building that is more or less divided into two sections. The southern section from the doorway towards us, the black entrance there, that is the busy, noisy, lively, learning, active areas of the museum. And beyond that, that, that entrance to the museum, the northern two thirds, um, you have the collection storage on the ground floor. And on the second floor, you have uh, a, the uh, sweeping exhibition hall, uh, the so-called, I guess, glass, uh, gl black box uh, parts of the museum. Uh, this is a terrific project uh, designed by our architects, LAT architects. But, and also the amazing colleagues on our project team, there are too many of them to mention here, but their work is also reflected in what we're seeing here and they've been terrific to work with. Let's go in through those main doors. I'm gonna to touch lightly on a few parts of this building. If you haven't seen these renderings before, I know many of you have, we're not gonna spend a lot of time exploring it together, but I wanna give you a sense of what's going where. Coming in the door straight ahead of us are the artisan workshops. Uh, and you'll see active classes there, canoe building, paddle carving, all kinds of learning things going on. And that's happening right up front. Straight ahead from us here is the reception desk and around the corner is a cafe serving fabulous teas and coffees. Uh, and there is a fireplace, uh, of course, where you can sit there and enjoy your time resting with us. Look to the second floor and you see our research and knowledge center, the archives of the museum. This is both for written records, rare books, and uh, also uh, recordings for oral histories. We have a recording area in there as well. If we turn around and we're gonna now look north, uh, I think probably the most striking feature of this entire ground floor, um, sorry about that architects, but from where I stand, it's gonna be this incredible collection center. This is a 20,000 square foot hall where we have the entire collection of the of canoes and kayaks that are not on exhibit are here resting and they're being cared for in a class a standards uh, conservation standards museum facility and we can provide facilitated tours to this and this is a really important commitment by the canoe museum uh, that we do that you know, we're not storing them off-site uh, that's been a real very important consideration for us 
if you look to the second floor and were hopped in that red canoe and paddled away from us, you'd be going right past the uh, education and uh, events space and into the exhibition hall. One thing that will change when this museum is actually built is all of the signage wayfinding in this building and on the campus will be in English, French, and the local dialect, Michisagig Anishinaabemowin. <clears throat> Thank you. And now I want to take us outside. If we went down to the far end of that cafe area and went outside, you would uh, step out onto this terrace. And really, this is the other um, real objective of this ambitious move is to bring this collection closer to water. In front of us, past the people drinking teas and coffees, is a canoe house, which is a point position to both getting people out onto the water. Uh, and making the connections between their experiences inside the building and the incredible water that's right here on Little Lake in Peterborough. Uh, there's a Trans-Canada Trail route that bisects the property. So this is a very busy pedestrian jogging, dog walking uh, path. And you can also visit the museum uh, by canoe itself and put your canoe up on a rack and come on in and, uh, and have an afternoon with us. Let's, going, let's go inside and now that you've seen the spaces, I just wanna show you the different areas sort of in mass. If you can see the, um, the, uh, the southern third, that busy noisy section is the left-hand part of this image. There's the reception desk and the cafe. And then that huge block to the right, that's our collection hall on the ground floor. Um, the dots are the structural columns and the long spaces running right to left are gonna create aisles between the racking. We'll take another look at that in a sec. Go to the second floor. We have at the very left side, you have all of the administrative areas of the museum, including the archives, library, and, and uh, archival storage. This area, which is the education and multi-purpose room, you can see all of the round tables set up for it. I guess we're having a wedding tonight and uh, there'll be a banquet held in there. And then uh, the corresponding large area of this space on the second floor is the exhibition hall. This is a 17,000 square foot exhibits area, uh, seven exhibit zones within these and uh, over a hundred canoes and kayaks uh, worked into those exhibits. If you just look back to the south end where the curves are, there is a sort of a curved sided triangle and that when you're standing on the second floor is an open area that lets down onto the, the first floor below. So it's a sort of a two story height open area. It lets you look up from the ground floor and you see the wonderful wooden ceilings of this part of the building. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop down to the ground floor and we're gonna take another look at that area because it's very important. The museum is no stranger to moving big canoes to the second floor. Uh, right now at 910 Monaghan Road in an old outboard motor factory, uh, we've managed to move many of our largest canoes into the second floor um, and quite successfully. We have a, a penetration in the wall at the north end and working with a hired crane and rigger system and a lot of volunteers who had rehearsed for days and days and days. Uh, we were able to do this transfer into the storage or into the exhibition hall successfully and without incident. And we'll be repeating that process in reverse order when we make this move. But this left us with an important lesson, which is let's not do that again. Let's design a building that can do all of this within its own framework, within its design. And I mentioned the amazing team we're working with, not just our architects, but structural engineers, mechanical, electrical, all of the various um, um, skill trades and expertise that we brought to bear conservation. Uh, we have them all working with us, making sure this building is doing everything we need it to. And one of, the, one of the key functions of this atrium area is when we need to move canoes from the collection center on the ground floor up to the exhibits, because we're doing new exhibits, or if we are changing out and canoes and kayaks are coming down from the exhibition hall on the second floor, and they're heading into the collection center on the ground floor to rest. This becomes the elevating area for the entire museum. And <clears throat> when that's happening, you certainly won't see children on the window bench there um, sitting, uh, we'll have it cleared for safety. And on the second floor, 
there is an enormous steel arm that swings out, a, uh, a, a boom hoist that swings out with a, uh, a winching hoist on it that gets lowered down. And we can lift and lower canoes from the ground floor to the second floor and back down in reverse order and make use of this space. And this is just one example of every area, every square inch of this building has been designed to serve uh, at least one function. Now, if we just walked in to the collection center from where we stand now, I wanna give you a sense of really what the uh, volume of canoes look like and um, our, all of the incredible thinking that's gone into making sure everything has a home, uh, that there is some room for growth and that we can provide a meaningful experience for our guests and also make the collection accessible for research or special visitation. So if we were to walk in and float above the collection center, Again, the curved section at the left side of this, that's that busy public area. To the right, this is the collection center on the ground floor. You see the rows and rows and rows of canoes, the colorful canoes. The colors reflect uh, the different construction types because we prefer to group them by how they are made. And by grouping all of the canoes onto racking, uh, you now have 10 walls of canoes, six or seven rows high, describing five pedestrian alleys and forklift alleys to make all of this work. At this point, I have to stop. I have to stop and give a big shout out to Ian McGee uh, uh, and the rest of the fabulous team at Let Architects. But Ian's been a real champion on this in, in working out the layout, not only of the canoes, but the racking arms that need to support them. Working with Mike Harrington to make sure all of the conservation needs are considered. There's been an incredible amount of work just to make sure this fits, that we have a bit of room for growth of the museum's collection uh, and that it works also for public circulation. Now, if you were to walk in either any two of these, uh, of these five aisles and you look to either side, this is the kind of granular research that's been done to make sure this work and I'm sliding to the next. Each of these long rectangles full of, well, these, these patterned rectangles is uh, a representation of almost a hundred canoes um, on, uh, on two walls of canoes. Sorry, I'm not explaining that well. If you walk down an aisle, you on your left, you would see uh, probably over 50 canoes uh, and to your right, another 50 uh, or more uh, re representing about 550 by the time you'd walk through it. And every canoe has been slotted nose to tail along the racking, a little bit of room end to end so that the forklift can withdraw them safely. There's a buffer above uh, each canoe to the rack arms to the next spot. It's been an incredible amount of work. It's work that Ian uh, assures us that he loves and I'm grateful for that. It certainly takes a special brain that I do not have and, uh, and it's, it's, it's amazing work. Now to care for these canoes and kayaks, you don't want to be putting just the, the, the vessels themselves directly on the rack arms. I think that goes without saying. The human eye really can only understand curved shapes like these if they're right side up. That's the way we're used to seeing them unless they're being portaged. And, uh, and so it was really clear that we wanted to store the canoes right side up. And it was also easier in all cases for us to manage their, their long-term storage needs by putting them on cradles. Uh, in many cases, the rim of the canoe, particularly with these dugouts is often the most fragile when you're carrying all that mass of the bottom of the canoe. And so they are better off, better served to be right side up. And so here at the current museum, we've made very simple wooden pallets to store each of the dugout canoes. There are about 65 of them on this wall here. And, uh, and, and here they be. Now, if you put this many canoes into a room, a collection hall as we are making uh, with the sprinkler systems and everything else, we are not doing this approach throughout the hall uh, this time around, we needed to open up the pallet design of each of these cradles in order to allow the passage of sprinkler water really uh, in order to, to, for the sprinklers to do what they do in an event we hope will never come. But uh, to, in order to manage that, we had to step away from wood with plywood decking or a torsion box, if you will, and go to an open framework. And again, the amazing team uh, that we're working with from structural engineers and mechanical uh, conservation, 
uh, have, have really leaned in on this and worked out a modular system to help us come up with that allows us to give as much flexibility to provide slings and supports to the canoes of the different size, different widths. These can be um, built to different unit lengths. Uh, and, and that's how all of Ian's slotting has been grouped then on those rackings. And so this way we know that the canoes themselves are sitting on a cradle pallet like this. The pallet is slightly wider, slightly longer than the, the precious object that's sitting on top of it. It has enough slings to support the, the canoe or kayak. And uh, most importantly, we're not lifting the canoe by our, with hands or with a forklift itself. We're actually lifting it by the cradle pallet that it's sitting on. That's absolutely critical. So we don't have these yet. Uh, we'll soon be receiving these uh, in large orders. And all of that great work that you saw Dane and Jen doing uh, in the collection center as they were cleaning and encapsulating the watercraft, the canoes will rest now once they are uh, positioned on a pallet. They'll rest on that pallet in a plastic bag, tagged and ready with tagging to know exactly where it's going in the new museum until it gets moved about 18 months from now. Maybe not 18, probably more like 16. I know the clock is ticking. So there is Mike Harrington, our, our conservation consultant uh, here doing a trial fit out with this prototype. This design has moved on some, some since then, but we're really proud of the work that's, he's doing, uh, that he's doing, that has been done here. And uh, I'll just give a shout out to the, this particular canoe. I know not everybody loves a Grumman. Um, I may be one of the few. Uh, because nobody steals mine, it seems, and I'm, I'm happy about that. It lives in the water for about 10 months of the year. Um, but uh, this Grumman actually belonged. It was one of three uh, canoes given to us by Gordon Lightfoot used for paddling the back river uh, many years ago, and it was a perfect one for us to, uh, to test fit uh, uh, this, with this pallet. So where are we now? Well, this project that you've seen a little bit of and uh, hope you are, um, if you're not receiving from us, you will be. Uh, you can find ways to get more involved and, and to keep up with this project as it moves and moves very quickly. This is a $40 million campaign to make all of this happen. And I'm really happy to say that we're now past 83% uh, committed to this, to this campaign. The building is a $28 million portion of that, just under that, 27.3. And, uh, and our support is coming in from right across the country. Uh, about a month ago, we held a construction commencement ceremony at the new site. It was an amazing day, and some of you were there. I was watching the names as they were coming in. Uh, we had to keep the visitation numbers down because of COVID restrictions, but many um, uh, joined in to watch the, uh, the ceremonies right after. It was a very moving day. Construction commencements begun, and so now construction itself has begun, and we're really excited about that. As all of this work has been going on, all of the people who are um, championing this project now, and certainly I have heard this uh, a great deal, is how can I help? I want to see this happen. I want this project to bring some hope uh, in, these, in these difficult times and, and tell me how I can help. Well, unfortunately, um, a pizza and beer party and a pickup truck is not exactly what we need right now. This is very careful, methodical work and I hope that I've conveyed a little bit of that tonight, but uh, we can all help. And um, on Monday, we launched our public phase. This is uh, a phase of the campaign. We are finally ready now to reach out across the country and we hope uh, inspire their imagination and present them with options and opportunities to pick up a corner of this project and help see it happen. On Monday, we launched a, a perky little three minute video that we're gonna run right now. And uh, we're very proud of it. I hope you like it. I'm gonna run this now and I'll see you on the far side of that. What a journey the Canadian Canoe Museum is on. We are building a brand new home for our one-of-a-kind collection of over 600 canoes, kayaks, and paddled watercraft. We are so close. We have an amazing new site on the water's edge in Peterborough. Construction of our beautiful new museum has already begun and development of our new exhibitions is well underway. We are standing in the heart of the Canadian Canoe Museum. 
surrounded by hundreds of canoes, kayaks, and paddled watercraft from across Canada and indeed around the world. This space is not normally open to the public, and this is where an incredible project is just getting underway. As you can imagine, moving a collection of this size is no small feat. If we gathered all of these vessels and lined them up nose to tail or bow to stern, they would stretch more than three kilometers long. A collection like this is an exquisite portrait of our relationship, ancient and enduring today, of our relationship to the environment and to its waters. Now, to prepare for this move, each object needs to be cleaned, documented, fitted with a pallet for transportation and storage, quarantined and inspected. And this is where you come in. By sponsoring the move of a canoe or a kayak or a paddle, you're not just moving an object, you're moving its stories and ensuring that the knowledge that it holds will be shared for generations to come. But what a gift that is. We are on our final portage to the water's edge. This is a unique opportunity for you to learn more and get involved in this incredible project. Help us move the collection. Visit canoemuseum.ca slash move to learn more and to sponsor a canoe, a kayak, or a paddle today. Uh, there are three great ways that you can, uh, you can get involved with us right now. And um, the, the first one uh, is to help us move this collection. There is a lot on our website uh, and to, to explore and it's going to be growing, uh, but it's in, um, inspired by the, the short video that we just watched. You should know that we are finding ways for the public to join us by uh, helping move the watercraft in this collection. Now, what we've done is we've grouped the collection by size ranges. So we have what we call the, the Great Portage. And these are the canoes and kayaks that are from 25 feet up to 53 feet long that are in the collection. Uh, then we also have the Big Lift uh, watercraft and uh, canoes and kayaks. And these are from 18 to 25 feet long. People can also opt for the Solo Portage which are the 16 to, or up to, up to 18 feet long canoes and kayaks. Or they can join us at the Paddle and Pack, which is a host, a, a whole range of small artifacts, canoes and canoe packs, or canoe, canoe paddles, kayak paddles, canoe packs, you name it. But also of course, canoe and kayak models, all of the tools and equipment that travel across as well. There are a lot of things to move in our museum's collection. And um, I hope you will join me in, uh, in, in supporting that program. You can also become a member and uh, joining the Canoe Museum's membership really improves our abilities to keep in touch with you, give you updates and share exciting new, uh, new developments with this project. And eventually as we are um, able to uh, host more events here uh, or at the site uh, to, to join us there. Lastly, you can also tell a friend. You can tell them what you're seeing tonight uh, and where the links are found on our website or found here, uh, or you can do all three. Um, this, this whole project, I can tell you, has been built on relationships. It's been truly amazing and inspiring to see, and word of mouth from us and from you is absolutely critical to, uh, to making this happen. So I hope you will, uh, I hope you will tell, uh, tell your community um, and, and make your community also the Canoe Museum's community. Well, thank you everybody. Thank you for joining. I wish I could see you. I can see there are a lot of chats here and uh, I look forward to reading them one by one after this point. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for getting involved. And uh, we look forward to bringing you more online content soon. And of course, we look forward to opening this new museum with you uh, summer 2023. Stay tuned.